Good day to you, my dear students. Um, I'm Sean Xavier Alquilita, so I'll be going to tackle about Aristotle's view about man as well as his view about virtue theory. So before we proceed, so please don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Okay, so let's go first with his idea of metaphysics as an introduction towards the understanding of man according to Aristotle. So highly morphism is the basis here of Aristotle's metaphysics from the Greek words highly and morphe which means matter and form and basically all things are made of um, prime matter and a substantial form. So in philosophy, the metaphysical view according to which every natural body consists of two intrinsic principles, one a potentiality, namely a prime matter, and the other one is the actuality, the principle of actuality, namely the substantial form. So what is matter and what is form? The matter is the stuff. So when you mean the stuff, um, what is it made of? You know, it answers the question what is it made of that makes us up things in the physical universe the form on the other hand is what gives the matter its shape it gives the matter to be what it is no? contrary to Plato Aristotle believed that form and matter are inextricably bound together in one world the one cannot exist without the other. <clears throat> okay, so let's proceed now with the on the soul. So I have here the book written by Aristotle. It's a thick one. It's a the basic works of Aristotle. All of the writings of Aristotle is being compiled in a one single book. And before we proceed further with the soul, I give you the introduction of his, uh, in this word, the anima, which means on the soul. Um, he said that, holding as we do that, while knowledge of any kind is a thing to be honored and prized, one kind of it may, either by reason of its greater exactness, or of a higher dignity and greater wonderfulness in its objects, be more honorable and precious than another. On both accounts, we should naturally be led to a place in front rank, the study of the soul. The knowledge of the soul admittedly contributes greatly to the advance of truth in general and above all to our understanding of nature, for the soul is in some sense the principle of animal life so that's the introduction so that is why uh, before I proceed with the virtue theory of Aristotle it is better to understand man as an introductory part in order to understand his ethical theory uh, ethical theory uh, Aristotle's ethical theory no Okay, so let's proceed. The word for soul um, in Aristotle is what we call it psyche in Greek. In Latin, it's translated as the anima. So for many readers, it is the use of the Latin term. So particularly as it was used by the Christian, the Muslim, and the Jewish theologians as well as philosophers that forms the basis of our modern understanding of the word. Under the theological tradition, the soul meant an immaterial, detached ruling power within a human. It was immortal and went to God after death. And that is the, um, the concept of the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish philosophers and theologians. But Aristotle does not think of the soul as spiritual, by the way. Does not think of the soul as can survive after the death. But Aristotle was 
basically explain that the soul is the principle of life okay so this is because that the matter and form combine to create unity not a duality so the philosopher can intellectually abstract out the separate constituents but in reality they are always united no body and soul is just only one okay so the soul is the principle of life that is why based on the hylomorphism here that the body is the principle of matter it is the principle of potentiality on the other hand the soul is the principle of substantial form or the principle of actuality so for aristotle even not only humans but even the animals and plants do have souls since that they have life everything that has a life has a soul okay so let's dissect each of these beings accordingly and let's try to describe what kind of soul these beings have let's start with the plants so these plants are the living creatures so if they are living creatures they also have life therefore they also have souls so the plants live according to nutrition and vegetation so if the plants live for nutrition and vegetation what kind of the soul do these plants have okay so the kind of soul is what we call it nutritive or vegetative soul next one is the animals so these animals also have souls according to Aristotle why because they are also capable of life okay so these animals live according to nutrition of course they do eat they can also drink without 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 nutrition they also they can uh, they cannot survive no and aside from nutrition they also live according to appetites according to senses not only appetites and senses they are capable of moving okay locomotion so what kind of these animals what kind of souls do these animals have and according to Aristotle it's what we call it the sensitive or sensory soul <coughs> okay how about us human beings we the human beings are also have souls okay because we are truly alive okay um, the human beings live according to nutrition and vegetation that is why we eat we eat our breakfast we eat our lunch we eat our dinner we also have our own appetites our sensations we have the five senses and also locomotion so we can run uh, we can walk uh, we can sleep okay and also uh, there is another thing that what the plants and the animals don't have it's the power of reason it's the power of our intellect and the power of will so what kind of souls do we have and it is what we call it as a rational soul
Okay, so I have already done with Aristotle's The Anima. So I've just summarized the entire book, The Anima of Aristotle. So that's what The Anima was all about. No? And the next one is the book uh, written by Aristotle, The Nicomachean Ethics. No? So uh, that is where we can understand Aristotle's moral theory. So here, this is the Nicomachean Ethics, Ethica Nicomachea. Uh -huh. Okay, so here, according to him in his introduction, that every art and every inquiry and similarly every action and pursuit is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has rightly been declared to be at that which all things aim. That is why all our actions gears towards the end. So what are these two types of ends? There's what they call it the instrumental end and the intrinsic end. The instrumental end is the end that gears towards an another end. Just an example, I want to cook rice. I want to cook fried rice. But in order to cook the fried rice, you have to cook first a steamed rice. Okay? So you have to wash the rice in the water. And then after washing it, you're going to put some water in it. And then you're going to boil it until you uh, until it's cooked as a steamed rice. That is an end. But that is not yet the purpose of your cooking. So you need to cook the rice into the frying pan in order to produce a fried rice and that is your and that is the another end so therefore this type of end is what we call it as an instrumental end the next one is what we call it as the intrinsic end the intrinsic end is the end itself okay the ultimate end Okay, so for Aristotle, the objective or end of our will is towards the good. But anyway, uh, with regards to Aristotle's view about good, because Aristotle did not define what good is, but he described what good is all about on the basis of, his, of its subjective function. But I will elaborate that one on the next slide no? um, so for some people there are some people who may view the good as with pleasure others would um, go to the restaurants to eat delicious food others would go to the disco to to be merry to dance some others would go to the beach to enjoy uh, to enjoy the weekend vacation. That is pleasure. Next one is wealth. We're talking here about money. So some others would view that their billions, their assets is a, a good for them. Some others would view good as power. That is why uh, there are some other uh, politicians um, strive hard to to uh, to attain the seat in the government just not because of the service but because of their own interests so for Aristotle these are what we call it as apparent goods so when you say an apparent good is something that what you think may be good but actually it is not the good itself because for Aristotle the highest good is something that is intrinsic the end itself and something that it is self-sufficient and something that is well, if it is self-sufficient therefore it is independent no? so for Aristotle the highest good is what we call it happiness or eudaimonia okay (coughs) 
Okay, so let's go f now. Imagine a person who always knows what to say, who can diffuse a tense situation, deliver tough news gracefully, is confident without being arrogant, brave but not reckless, generous but never extravagant. This is the type of person that everybody wants to be around and to be like. Someone who seems to have mastered the art of being a person. <clears throat> so this may sound like an impossible feat, but Aristotle believed that while rare, these people do exist, and they are what we all should aspire to be virtuous. And there's a whole moral theory based on this idea of virtue. So for Aristotle, what is virtue? Virtue theory is an ethical theory that emphasizes an individual's character rather than following a set of rules. But unlike most of the moral theories we discussed, virtue theory doesn't spend a lot of time telling you what to do. There's no categorical imperative or principle of utility. Instead, virtue theory is all about character, rather than saying follow these rules so you can be a good person. Um, Aristotle and other virtue theorists reason that if we can just focus on being a good people, right actions will follow effortlessly. So to become a good person, you will do good uh, you will do good things. No rule book needed. So why should you be a virtuous person? It is because of happiness. Or shall I, what we call it as eudaimonia. Okay. Virtue theory reflects the ancient assumption that humans have fixed nature and essence. And that w the way we flourish is by adhering to that nature. So Aristotle described this in terms of what he called proper functioning. So that is what I've already said a while ago. Everything has a function and a thing is good to the extent that um, it fulfills its function and bad to the extent that it doesn't. So this is easy to see in subjects created by humans. A function of a knife is to cut, a dull knife is a bad knife, and a function of a flower is to grow and reproduce. So a flower that doesn't grow is just a, be a bad being a flower. Same goes for humans. We're animals, so all the stuff that we could indicate proper functioning for an animal holds true for us as well. We need to grow and be healthy and fertile. We're also the rational animals and a social animal, so our function also involves using our reason and getting along with our pack. Now you might notice that some of this sounds a lot like parts of the natural law theory. St. Thomas Aquinas' theory that God made us with the tools we need to know what is good. Well, Aristotle had a strong influence on St. Thomas Aquinas. So part of Aristotle's thoughts on virtue ended up in a natural law. Uh, but for Aristotle, this is not about God's plan. It's just about nature. Aristotle argued that nature has built into us the desire to be virtuous in the same way that acorns are built with the drive to become oak trees. So what exactly does it mean to be virtuous? And according to Aristotle, 
Having a virtue just means doing the right thing at the right time, in the right way, in the right amount, toward the right people. So there's no need to be specific because if you're virtuous, you know what to do all the time. You know how to handle yourself and how to get along with others. You have good judgment and you can read a room and you know what's right and when. Aristotle understood virtue as a set of robust character traits that once developed will lead to a predictably good behavior. You can think virtue as a midpoint between two extremes, which Aristotle called vices. So, virtue is just the right amount, the sweet spot between the extreme of excess and the extreme of deficiency. And the sweet spot is known as the golden mean. So just an example, walking home from a movie, you see a person being holed up or mugged. What is the courageous action for you to take? Your impulse might be to say that a courageous person would run over there and stop the mugging because the courage means putting yourself in harm's way for a good cause, right? But for Aristotle, it is absolutely not. So, for Aristotle, a virtuous person in Aristotelian sense would first take a stock of the situation. So, that the situation might be, for example, the time is around 10 11 pm, the location is outside the movie theater, the overview is the large man mugging or hold up a lo older lady attempting to steal her purse. So, what is your option? Either to intervene, call for help, or you just leave her alone. So, if you size up the mugger and have a good reason to believe that you could safely intervene, then that's probably the courageous choice. But if you assess the situation and recognize that intervention is likely to mean that both of you and the victim will be in danger, the courageous choice is not to intervene but to call for help instead. So, to, according to Aristotle, courage is the midpoint between the extremes of cowardice and recklessness. Cowardice is a deficiency of courage, while recklessness is an excess of too much courage, and both are bad. Aristotle said that you definitely can have too much of a good thing. So being a courageous doesn't mean rushing headlong into a danger. A courageous person will assess the situation, they will know their own abilities, and they will take action that is right in a particular situation. Part of having courage, he argued, is being able to recognize when, rather than stepping in, you need to find an authority who can handle a situation that's too big for you to tackle alone. Basically, courage is finally the right way to act. A lot of time, but not all the time. That means doing a right thing that you know you're capable of, even if it scares the pants off of you.
Okay, so um, here, um, Aristotle thought all virtue works like this. The right action is always a midpoint between the extremes. So there is no all or nothing in this theory. Even honesty, the virtue of honesty. In this view, honesty is the perfect midpoint between brutal honesty and failing to say things that we need to be said. Okay, so like no one needs to be told. It also means knowing how to deliver hard truths gracefully, know how to break bad news gently, or to offer criticism in a way that's constructive rather than soul crushing. So the same goes for the virtue of generosity. Um, it avoids the obvious vice of stinginess, but also doesn't give too much. It is not danger. Uh, it is not generous to give drugs to an addict, or to buy a round of drinks for everyone in the bar when you need that money for rent. The right amount of generosity means giving when you have it to those who need it. It can mean having the disposition to give just for the heck of it, but also means realizing when you can or shouldn't give. So now you can see why Aristotle's definition of virtue was totally vague, where that golden mean is depends on the situation, but if you have to figure out if you have to figure out what virtue is in every situation, how can you possibly ever learn to be virtuous? Okay, so here's the table of Aristotle's The Golden Mean. So courage, so excess of courage is rashness, deficiency is cowardice. So the temperance, so the excess, licentiousness, and insensibility, okay, liberality, so liberality, so excess is prodigality, being wasteful, illiberality or meanness, that means that you are already stingy enough, no? Magnificence, magnanimity, proper ambition. So excess is too much ambitious, you're already ambitious enough, and deficiency is being lazy or unambitiousness. Same goes for patience, same goes for truthfulness. So excess of being truthful is be being uh, vulgar or boast boastful, and deficiency is understatement. The same as also with humor, or applies to humor, witness. So, but the excess of that is not good. It's what we call this buffoonery. And deficiency is boorishness. The same goes with friendliness or being friendly. Friendship is also a virtue for Aristotle. No? And there are three types of friendship. There is what we call it as the, um, the friendship in pleasure, the friendship in utility, and a friendship of excellence. So of these three, these first two, friendship of pleasure and the friendship of utility does not uh, do do not um, last long. Why? Because they're just only, these people are just only using your friendship for their own pleasures, for their own utility. But the real friendship comes in the friendship in excellence why it's because a real friend is someone who um, a real friend is someone who excels you who gives you excellence in character um, who wants to give out the best in you so that is friendliness now too much by being friendship is uh, what we call it as flattery or obsequiousness but the deficiency is by being aloof <laughs> as if that you are that that you are confined being alone 
Okay, the same as also with the virtue of modesty. No? And the too much is by being shy. But the deficiency is by being kapala ng muka or shamelessness. Okay, so another one here is the righteous indignation. So too much of it is what we call it as envy. And the deficiency is the malicious enjoyment. Okay, so virtue is a kind of knowledge that he called practical wisdom. You might think of it as a, like a street smarts. And telling, and the thing about the street smarts is that you're gonna learn them on the street. But the good news is you don't have to do it alone. So Aristotle said that your character is developed through habituation. If you do a virtuous thing over and over again, eventually it will become part of your character in the beginning it will be hard and maybe it will feel fake because you're just copying someone who's better than you at being a good person so but over time these actions will become an ingrained part of your character and eventually it becomes a robust trait that Aristotle was talking about. It will just manifest every time you need it. That's when you know you have a virtue fully realized and it becomes effortless. Okay, but why? What is your motivation? What if you had no desire to be the guy who always says the right thing or the lady who always finds the right courage when it's needed? So, by the way, you know what the right thing to do is in the first place. It's by finding someone who really kn already knows and emulating them. These people who already possess virtue are what we call it as the moral exemplars. And according to this theory, we are built with the abil ability to recognize them and the desire to emulate and to follow them. So you learn, by, you learn virtue by watching it and then doing it by watching them and do as what they do and do as what they say. So the virtue theory says that you should become virtuous because if you are, then you can attain the pinnacle of humanity. It allows you to achieve what is known as the eudaimonia. So it doesn't have to be simple English translation. So, what is by mean eudaimonia? It's a happiness. It's a human flourishing. A life will live. Or from the Greek terms, uh, that means uh, a good life. <coughs> so, a life of eudaimonia is a life of striving. It is a life of pushing yourself to your limits and finding success. A eudaimonistic life will be full of happiness that comes from achieving something really difficult rather than just having it handed to you. But choosing to live a eudaimonistic life means that you're never done improving, you're never to a point where you can just coast. You're constantly setting new goals and working to develop new muscles. Choosing to live in this way also means you'll face disappointments and failures. Eudaimonia doesn't mean a life of cupcakes and rainbows. It means the sweet pleasure of sinking into bed and at the end of an absolutely exhausting day, it is a satisfaction of knowing you've accomplished a lot and that you've pushed yourself to the very best person you could be. So this is morality for Aristotle. It is being the best person you can be, honing your strengths while working on your weaknesses. And for Aristotle, the kind of person who lives like this is the kind of person who will do good things. So today, we learn about virtue theory. So we studied the golden mean, 
and how it exists as a midpoint with, between vices and excess and deficiency. So we talk about moral exemplars and the life of eudaimonia that comes with virtuousness. So thank you, uh, thanks for watching, uh, please don't forget to share, like and subscribe to my YouTube page for more videos on Philo 101 subject. Once again, I'm Sean Xavier Alcalita, thank you very much.